Hey guys, today I'll show you a zombie horror TV series named The Walking Dead World Beyond Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins 10 years after zombies ruled the world, where the Civic Republic, one of the only three remaining human habitats on Earth, is still scheming against other humans rather than the zombie race. They secretly installed remote-controlled bombs along the wall of the Omaha Gathering Place. Then they used helicopters to attract thousands of zombie hordes to surround Omaha. The survivors of the community were all terminated, while the troops of the Republic greedily took all their supplies away. Soon after, Hope, a genius girl in science, was also targeted by the Republic. To protect her companions, Hope agreed to join the Republic with Colonel Kublek. But Kublek didn't take her back to the city. She took her straight to the top of a building. She then regretfully told Hope that their habitat, Omaha, had been attacked by zombie hordes. Although they arranged for a helicopter rescue at the first moment, only a few people were rescued. Therefore, Hope became even more important in her role. They wanted to test Hope. Only if she showed true capacity could they confidently take her to meet her father, Dr. Bennett. On the other hand, Felix's good friend Will told the group a completely different story. Because they hadn't received any information from Omaha for several days, Will and his colleagues found the officers of the Republic to report the problem. The officer told him that there was a problem with the relay station, and he could arrange for someone to take Will to repair it right now. But before getting in the car, they unusually put a hood on Will. Will sensed something was wrong, so the two tacitly took action, seizing the guns in the car and fighting with the soldiers of the Republic. After a round of gunfire, a stray bullet killed the driver, and the armored car flipped into a ditch. Many zombies who heard the noise came around, and Will and his colleague took the opportunity to flee. Unfortunately, his colleague was shot and killed by a surviving soldier halfway, and Will fled into the forest. During his exile, he accidentally saw the transport troops of the Republic. They were transporting materials from Omaha one truck after another, and there was still the fresh blood of survivors on them. After hearing this story, Iris's tears flowed down. She urgently asked about her father's safety. Will told her that Dr. Bennett should be safe, and because Will knew too much, he had been chased by soldiers of the Republic. Fortunately, he met these kind-hearted people who took him in, and that's how he escaped. Due to the downfall of Omaha, Felix and Iris were now homeless, and they had to join Will's gang. They traveled in a carriage to a nearby small town. After the town's mayor took their weapons, she immediately arranged accommodation for everyone. Felix and Will got a room with a big bed. As soon as they entered the room, Felix took off his clothes and threw himself into Will's warm arms, crying like a giant baby. Once everyone had managed to stabilize their emotions, they gathered to discuss how to deal with the Republic and their plan to rescue their teammates. Under immense pressure, Iris dreamt again of an adult zombie that night. When she ripped off the zombie's face, what was revealed was the helmet of a soldier from the Republic. Iris woke up with a start, unable to sleep anymore. She picked up the crossbow on the table and went into the forest alone, planning to hunt and level up. Surprisingly, she didn't find any zombies after wandering in the forest for a while, but she did encounter a patrolling soldier from the Republic. Iris instinctively raised her crossbow. The soldier had attracted the attention of a zombie. Just as the soldier was about to kill the zombie, Iris decisively shot the soldier in the shoulder with her crossbow. She then approached and began to grapple with the soldier. During the muscle wrestling, Iris stabbed her dagger into the soldier's hairy chest. For the first time in her life, she had killed a living person. Looking at the familiar mask of the Republic, she was reminded of her dream. In her dream, when she lifted the face of the zombie, she saw the mask of a soldier from the Republic. Now, what was revealed was a young face filled with terror. This time, Iris didn't hesitate and stabbed him again. Felix arrived in time. He knew there were still many soldiers in the forest, so he quickly dragged the soldier's body away and hid it. When the patrolling soldiers had left, he let out a sigh of relief. But just then, three nearby zombies, attracted by the noise, shuffled closer. In order to avoid being discovered by the patrolling soldiers, Iris shot a bolt through a zombie's forehead. The other two zombies had staggered closer. Felix had no choice but to jump out and stab one zombie in the brain. To prevent the soldiers from discovering them, he slowly laid the zombie on the ground. However, the other zombie took advantage of this and came to his side. Felix was caught off guard and his knife got stuck in the zombie's ribs. He had no choice but to choke the zombie from behind. Iris confidently pulled the trigger, a precise headshot. Immediately after, Iris lay down on the ground, not daring to come out until the soldiers from the Republic had retreated. 
On the other side, Hope, who was facing the test of survival alone, had also run into trouble. In the eerie and terrifying apartment building, where terror-inspiring words were written all over, Hope cautiously moved forward. Suddenly, a zombie pounced on her face. Hope instantly lost her balance and tumbled to the ground with the zombie. Although she managed to kill the zombie, she herself got a knock on the head. In her dazed state, she started hallucinating, mistaking the zombie for Colonel Kublek, and thus her attack was swift and ruthless. A single stab was all it took to end the zombie's shitty life. Afterward, Hope staggered out of the apartment, only to find an even larger number of zombies in the courtyard. Unable to fight off four zombies with her bare hands, Hope had no choice but to duck into a room. Zombies, incapable of opening doors, could only crowd around the window, desperately reaching in, trying to grab Hope. Just then, a ragged survivor rushed out. She brandished a knife and started attacking Hope without delay. It turned out that she was the test set by Colonel Kublek. Only by learning to kill would Hope be considered to have graduated perfectly. But Hope didn't want to do this. She kept retreating, trying to persuade the woman to stop. But the woman brandished her knife and lunged at Hope again. Hope dodged smoothly, and her bayonet grazed the woman's calf, causing her to lose her balance. She fell in front of the window and was grasped by a group of zombies. The zombies, having just enjoyed a thrilling action scene, then had a wonderful dinner. For a moment, their roars were filled with a hint of happiness. In this way, Hope finally passed Colonel Kublek's test. Kublek kept his promise and took her to the helicopter, flying straight to the experimental base where Dr. Bennett was based. Under the supervision of the soldiers, the father and daughter finally met. Not long after, Hope discovered that her dad had already found her a stepmother named Dr. Lila. The little girl could not accept this reality for a moment. She hid in the bathroom until her stepmother left. Dr. Bennett quickly asked his daughter if she had encountered any dangers along the way. Only then did Hope manage to squeeze out a smile, stating that everyone was fine. She was just worried about his safety. She didn't expect her father to be so vigorous and nasty that he found her a stepmother in such a short time. Seeing the atmosphere becoming awkward, Dr. Bennett simply left the room. He was going to find Colonel Kublek and ask them to bring Iris over as soon as possible, or he would stop his research. Not long after Dr. Bennett left, Dr. Lila, who wanted to gain Hope's approval, came over and offered to show Hope around to familiarize her with the surroundings. But Hope wasn't interested in her incessant descriptions, and she made up an excuse to leave. Not long after, she found a room with a big red warning sign on it. Out of curiosity, she was about to go in when she was recognized by a passing young man. Seeing Hope's serious expression, the young man opened the door for Hope to visit. It turned out that this was just an ordinary utility room filled with brooms and wires. The sign had been put up simply because the cleaning lady was overly particular about cleanliness. In this way, after arriving in the Republic, Hope made a new friend. Meanwhile, the three individuals who managed to evade the patrols of soldiers last night didn't have it easy. They knew that the forces of the Republic would return here the next day to search for their missing comrade. So early in the morning, they went out and caught a zombie of similar height to the soldier. They dressed it in human clothes and used it as a decoy to distract the troops' attention. In the meantime, they went to meet the mayor, hoping to persuade her to join their group. But before they could finish their proposition, several military vehicles bearing the insignia of the Republic roared into the town. The mayor quickly signaled for the group to hide behind a blanket. Just as they had hidden themselves, Colonel Kublik personally walked in. On the surface, she was casually chatting with the mayor, but in reality, she was inspecting the entire room, trying to find possible hiding places. After scanning the room, Kublik started walking towards the blanket, causing Felix to nervously grip his knife handle. Just at the critical moment, Kublik's walkie-talkie buzzed. The message reported that a figure resembling the missing soldier was spotted on the road. With this, Kublik waved her hand and left the town, heading in the direction of the missing soldier. At this time, Hope had managed to sneak into her father, Dr. Bennett's office. Her stepmother then started to chatter away, sharing with Hope about the challenges Dr. Bennett has faced and the greatness of his current work. Worried that Hope might not believe her, Dr. Lila even turned on the television to play a documentary about her father. After watching the video, Hope realized how incredible her father was. The biological research that had made no progress for several years made a significant leap forward in just two months after Dr. Bennett's arrival. According to Dr. Bennett, if this research is successful, humans could accelerate the decomposition of zombies on a large scale, thereby returning a green and clean world to humanity. The scene shifts 
to Silas, who had been captured earlier, being taken away by a burly man named Dennis. Due to a severe lack of manpower in the Republic, Silas was directly assigned to Dennis, becoming his child labor force. Just as they were on their way, a zombie appeared in front of them. Dennis ran right over it, splattering diabetic blood. The sight instantly quashed any thoughts of escape that Silas had been harboring. Soon, Dennis's car stopped in front of a building. He handed Silas a set of clothes and an odd-looking spear. He then led Silas into a large, smoking clearing in front of them. The ground was littered with shattered zombie bodies, and a few individuals were using similar spears to finish off any zombies still moving. Dennis whistled, calling everyone over, and introduced Silas as a newcomer. From this day forward, he would join them in clearing out the zombies. After explaining this, Dennis arranged for Silas to experience his new job by bursting a zombie corpse. Though Silas felt a bit squeamish, he did not hesitate and quickly dispatched the zombie, securing his new role. It turns out, the Republic had a plan to eradicate the zombies, which was being carried out steadily. Every so often, they would use a helicopter to attract zombies to a plaza, then drop bombs to obliterate them. Silas and his group were then tasked to finish off the remaining zombies, effectively clearing out a large wave of undead. While everyone was working, Dennis climbed into a pickup truck, preparing to deliver a zombie to the lab. Once in the vehicle, he took out a picture and studied it closely. It was a photo of him and Huck when they were younger, indicating that their past relationship was anything but ordinary. During the decade-long era of zombies, humans had cultivated a unique zombie culture and belief system. They killed two zombies, and even made them the latest offerings for ritual. A hooded figure kneels down, gouging out the zombies' eyeballs. Then he brings two clusters of fresh flowers, placing them into the empty sockets of the zombie's face. Meanwhile, Elton and Percy, both hungry, are riding on the same Ferrari horse, racing across the wilderness. Suddenly, they see wisps of smoke ahead. The sight brightens their eyes, and they quietly approach to investigate. They discover a young brother and sister enjoying their lunch around a campfire. Seeing that, Percy wants to use his eloquence to swindle the siblings out of their food. Elton instantly objects. In his view, they just need to communicate honestly and ask for some food. Having said that, Elton walks out with his hands raised. The sister, enamored by Elton's handsome face, actually brings out a portion of food for him. She introduces herself as Asha, the mayor's daughter, and the man next to her is her older brother, Dev. But before they could chat much, a strange noise is heard from their parked car. The siblings immediately grab their weapons and rush over, only to see Percy holding a bag, ready to raid their food supplies. Percy, always a thief at heart, was determined to steal even when Elton was about to get food. This implicated Elton, who could no longer explain himself and had to flee. The siblings would not let them escape easily and chased after them with their weapons. Seeing they were slow, they even kindly threw a flying axe to hasten their speed. Elton and Percy, in a state of panic, rushed into an unfamiliar forest, quickly attracting many zombies. The siblings trailing behind had no choice but to stop and deal with these zombies. Facing the zombie onslaught, the siblings, with their excellent teamwork, quickly eliminate many of them. Seeing that the siblings were not in danger, Elton and Percy continued to flee. However, as they were running, Elton was tripped by something. Soon after, the zombies covered in grass and flowers emerged from the ground. Having been lying there for so many years, they were presented with a tender young man. So they immediately howled and pounced on his muscles. Elton, scared and retreating, was grabbed by a zombie on his leg, while another wrapped around his neck. Just when he was about to be bitten, a flying axe arrived just in time, chopping down the zombie in front of him. It was the siblings, Asha and Dev, who had arrived. Dev rushed forward, first pulling off the zombie pressing down on Percy. Asha ran in front of Elton, kicking down a smelly zombie attacking his smelly part. Elton himself reached for an axe on the ground, sending away his opponent. Asha had just cleared the surrounding zombies and walked over panting. She wanted to help Elton up, but a zombie covered in grass sprung from the ground, biting onto Elton's wrist. Asha, in her desperation, grabbed a tree branch, sending the zombie to meet Jesus. Following that, she pushed Elton to the ground, calling her brother over to amputate his hormone-let-go arm. Seeing that he was about to lose his arm, Elton screamed, explaining to the siblings about the material of his clothing. Once they were sure Elton had not been bitten, Asha suddenly had a good idea and put on Elton's protective suit. Elton was left only in his smelly underwear, reduced to a prisoner. Then the siblings began to arrange the zombie bodies. After placing them properly, they took out a spoon, beginning a mysterious eyeball gouging ritual. The brothers kneeling on the side had never seen such a brutal scene and were almost scared to wet themselves. 
They wondered if their eyes would be gouged out next. Fortunately, the siblings did not intend to deal with them immediately. After planting flowers onto the zombie corpses, they immediately lifted them onto a luxurious Ferrari carriage, driving towards their home. As they continued their journey, a warning sign indicating a toxic area suddenly appeared ahead. Dev and Asha quickly pulled out gas masks and put them on. Elton promptly voiced his hopes for some respect for human rights and requested they provide them with gas masks as well. However, when Dev got out of the vehicle, he simply put shabby bags over their heads, treating them like criminals. Soon after, their Ferrari carriage reached its destination. The hoods were removed from the two men's heads. Asha cut their ropes with a knife. Subsequently, Asha took off her gas mask and called out their names. Not far away, Dev was also walking towards them with Iris. It turned out this was the small town where Iris had been hiding. Due to Iris often talking about her past with everyone, the siblings recognized Elton and Percy from the start. They had tied them up as a joke. After surviving near-death experiences, Iris and Elton hugged each other as soon as they met, but without a kiss. While hugging, Iris noticed Percy, who looked very awkward. Realizing Percy was still alive, Iris pushed Elton away and walked over to give Percy a loving hug. Afterwards, everyone gathered together to exchange information. Elton listened to everyone talking, but no one mentioned Iris's sister, Hope. He couldn't help but ask about Hope's whereabouts. Unbeknownst to them, Hope had already arrived in the Republic and was jogging on the training field of the research center. She wasn't doing this for exercise, but to survey the area. Her trick of pretending to tie her shoelaces was too cliché. The guard nearby was probably rolling his eyes behind his mask. Meanwhile, Dr. Bennett found Huck again, wanting her to help find his daughter Iris. Otherwise, he would stop his research. Hope, back in the base, reverted to her wild self, having a blast with the others of her age. However, during their joys, Hope would occasionally zone out, worried about the safety of her companions outside. After the celebration, she knocked on Huck's door again for a heart-to-heart. -heart. She felt that Huck should join her in searching for Felix and Iris. After all, with the current conflicts, only she could calm Felix down. Coupled with Dr. Bennett's threat, Huck finally agreed after weighing the pros and cons. Tomorrow was her patrol shift, and she could easily take Hope out as long as she found a car with a hidden compartment. In order to get a car, Huck turned to her boyfriend, Dennis. After a discussion, Huck got the car, and in this way, she left the Republic with Hope. After a full day's journey, the two of them arrived on the outskirts of the town under the starlit sky. Not long after, they were led into the residential area by two guards. Their arrival caught everyone's attention immediately. Iris was the first to rush over and embraced her sister, while Percy hid in the shadows, staring intensely at Huck, his eyes brewing with hatred. Just finished clearing out zombies and ready to return from their patrol, Felix and Will had also noticed the heartfelt reunion. Will was about to greet them but was stopped by Felix. He believed that Huck could glean too much information if Will showed up. He decided to interrogate Huck himself first. The town's mayor also came out at this time. Following protocol, they disarmed Huck and then left, leaving the main group to continue their business. Soon, both sides started arguing over information. Huck believed that Omaha was destroyed by a zombie horde, while Felix and the others insisted that Omaha fell at the hands of the Republic. The debate ended without resolution, with everyone sticking to their own claims. Seeking some peace, Huck walked into the forest alone. Unexpectedly, Felix followed her. With a surprise attack, he knocked her down and caught a zombie. He brought the zombie to Huck, wanting her to taste the flavor of death. Of course, Felix chose to hold back at the last moment. After all, if anything happened to Huck here, Colonel Kublik would definitely suspect the town. He threw the zombie aside, crushing its head and left Huck with some harsh words. When Felix returned to the camp, he found that Percy had taken a weapon and sneaked into the forest. Realizing Huck might be in danger, he and Will quickly pursued, each taking a different direction. Just as Percy was about to shoot, Will and Felix arrived in time to stop him. Seeing that their lives were at risk if they continued to stay here, Huck and Hope prepared to leave before dawn. Tearfully, Iris bid farewell to Hope, promising that she would find a way to rescue them as soon as possible. On the other side, Silas followed the small team to start a new wave of luring in the zombies. They turned on the top-level spotlights used for concerts, followed by the loudspeakers playing heavy metal rock for the zombies. Then, they fired hundreds of thousands of fireworks into the sky, creating an epic concert effect even amidst the apocalypse. 
When the density of the zombie horde reached a certain level, they activated the bombs they had already buried, sending the fanatical zombies skyward. A zombie with a huge antenna on its back walked forward. This was the zombie alpha the lab specifically needed. The team quickly stopped the blasting, rushed down with long spears, and quickly stabbed the nearby zombies. A guy with a lasso approached and lassoed the zombie alpha. He quickly turned and retreated. Dennis was lurking at the doorway and called for Silas's help. He opened the iron door, let everyone in, and promptly locked it. Afterwards, Dennis gathered everyone together to give them a tongue lashing. He questioned why such an important test subject wasn't identified earlier, as it was mixed with ordinary zombies. If the zombie alpha had been blown up, everyone's year-end bonus would have been forfeited. Silas seemed unable to adapt to such an environment and stood dumbfounded. Seeing that, Dennis immediately redirected his anger, scolding Silas. He then tossed his tools to Silas who tried to catch them, but ended up reopening his wound. The tools fell to the ground and blood quickly seeped out. Dennis then took Silas back to the office and personally stitched up his wound. Despite the decent meals at this place, Silas missed Iris and the others, so he packed his things to sneak away while everyone was asleep like a pig. However, he was discovered by his mates just as he reached the door. Worried they would inform Dennis, Silas quickly asked them if they would snitch. The others shook their heads, stating they didn't need to inform their superior when dealing with deserters because they had their own way of handling it. They then shoved Silas into a nearby warehouse and locked the door. The warehouse was pitch black. Silas quickly picked up a baseball bat for self-defense. At that moment, the zombies in the warehouse also smelled fresh meat and came out ready for a meal. Unable to escape from the main door, Silas had to head deeper into the warehouse, only to find there was no back door. As the zombies got closer, Silas had to fight back with his only weapon. Swinging his bat left and right, he smashed their heads and stabbed their eyes. He managed to knock down the horde of zombies, but his healed wound tore open again because of the intense fight. However, Silas didn't rush to bandage it. Instead, he tidied his messy hair and turned to look behind. Several zombies were trying to approach, but they were chained and could only growl in place. Just as Silas was gathering his strength to wipe out the zombies, his mates opened the door and walked in. They commented on Silas's achievements, but Silas asked them about the purpose of the warehouse. They told him it was used for training everyone's skills and psychological endurance. It turned out they thought Silas was too much of a chicken boy, so they arranged this lesson for him, hoping he would gain some courage to continue fighting the zombies with them. They even promised him a good position, as long as he performed well here. However, Silas had no interest in becoming a soldier for the Republic. He dropped his baseball bat and walked away before they finished speaking. He went back and got a few bottles of medication, preparing to continue his escape, but Dennis appeared timely and stopped him. As the leader, Dennis didn't question why Silas was trying to flee, but instead lit a cigarette and sat there, waiting for Silas to speak up. Unable to hold back, Silas revealed that he had friends outside who were facing unknown dangers, and he needed to go and rescue them as soon as possible. Dennis analyzed the situation for Silas, saying that his friends were definitely stronger than he imagined, and that he would likely end up getting devoured by a zombie. After hearing this, Silas found it convincing and turned to go back to his room, but Dennis stopped him again, telling him to take the vodka on the table to disinfect his wound. It was clear that people in the Republic had two factions. Some hoped to wipe out all zombies by using explosives, while others advocated for genetic research to eradicate zombies worldwide in a short time. The scene then shifts to a zombie who hadn't eaten fresh food for 10 years. With half of its body rotted, it could only wander aimlessly in the forest. Suddenly it smelled the long-lost scent of flesh and began to search, only to be stabbed in the head by a dagger. It turns out to be Iris making the attack. She had learned of Silas's whereabouts from Huck and immediately led the group towards the base where Silas was located. On the way, they encountered a few wandering zombies. With their rich experience, they easily dealt with them and took them down in a few hits. Unfortunately, this base had been attracting zombies by various means. Seeing the zombies piled up in the ditch ahead, they realized that it would be bad to force their way through. So Felix and Will made noise to attract the zombies' attention, while the others took the opportunity to bypass the dense zombie area and look for traces of Silas. With the assistance of the two, the rest of them sprinted all the way and actually bumped into Silas, who was cleaning up stray zombies outside the base. Long separated friends finally reunited. Silas happily took the three back to the base and talked about their respective experiences. 
At that time, the three proposed to go to the Republic to rescue Dr. Bennett and Hope, but they didn't have suitable transportation and hoped that Silas could get a vehicle from the base. Silas initially refused. After all, Dennis had always been nice to him, and now he was reluctant to steal Dennis's car. It wasn't until Iris came alone, pleading pitifully, that Silas felt he had no choice but to agree. Iris was overjoyed and immediately gave Silas a gift, a group photo she had secretly drawn. Having settled the support, they went back to the town to discuss plans. They had the town mayor report to Kublek that they had caught Iris, so they could openly send Iris and others into the Republic. As expected, Colonel Kublek did not suspect anything. Instead, she was happy to let Iris meet Hope and Dr. Bennett, as Hope's arrival brought new ideas to the lab, and the hope of speeding up the development of the zombie-corroding drug. Meanwhile, Silas managed to deceive Dennis into handing over the car keys. However, the moment he received the keys, he felt a bit dazed and guilty towards Dennis. Iris and the others returned home with Dr. Bennett and immediately began discussing their escape plan. At first, Dr. Bennett didn't agree, considering the high risk of being caught by the soldiers if they were to escape. But seeing both of his daughters agree to leave, he eventually agreed to the plan. On the other hand, Huck returned home and initiated a conversation with his mother, Colonel Kublek. Unfortunately, the conversation didn't go well, as both mother and daughter had their own thoughts. At noon the next day, just as Dr. Bennett was about to bid farewell to Dr. Lila, Huck rushed out to stop him, claiming to have critical intelligence to share. They entered a warehouse where Huck pulled out a list of names found at Kublek's place. The list contained the names of people used in the experiments, all of whom were former members of Omaha. Huck didn't believe that the Republic had annihilated the Omaha base, but now it seemed all too real. Kublek and the others had been using their former family members as lab rats. As the planned escape time approached, everyone nervously checked their watches. But a group of soldiers suddenly rushed out of the parking lot, surrounded Silas, and captured him on the spot. The escape plan failed before it even started. What Dr. Bennett didn't know was that his new wife was the scientist leading the special research project. Due to the failure of their escape plan, they had to send out a message for everyone to stay calm. Dr. Bennett spent day and night studying the list, hoping to understand their research. At that time, Dr. Lila came over with a bag of clothes for their daughters to wear at the dinner that night. However, Dr. Bennett canceled the dinner. His wife, startled, accidentally dropped the clothes. Both of them squatted down to pick up the clothes, and Dr. Bennett remembered a similar scene from their first meeting months ago. Dr. Lila had dropped a pile of documents, including that list. At that moment, Dr. Bennett realized that Dr. Lila had been the spy placed by Kublek all along. Upon returning, Dr. Bennett shared this news with everyone. He also suggested infiltrating Dr. Lila's lab, where they might find evidence of Colonel Kublek and others' illegal activities. To bypass security, Felix sought Huck's help. Huck cloned an access card, and together with Felix, they infiltrated the secret lab. But the final door was beyond her access level. The only way to open it was to cut off the power, but the door would switch to backup power within two minutes. Huck instructed Felix to act quickly. After synchronizing the time via the intercom, she decisively short-circuited the transformer, causing a blackout. Armed with a flashlight, Felix entered, discovering numerous experimental specimens and vials of green reagent. While searching, she kept an eye on her watch, ready to retreat at any moment. Unexpectedly, the backup power system had been altered already. The door resumed power in less than two minutes, trapping Felix in the extremely cold lab. At that moment, Dr. Bennett was having dinner with Dr. Lila when suddenly the room went dark. Worried about potential issues in the lab, Dr. Lila prepared to leave. But she invited Dr. Bennett to accompany her, saying she had something important to tell him. By now, Dr. Bennett had lost trust in her. He quietly pocketed a dinner knife for protection before they left. Unexpectedly, Dr. Lila didn't lead him to the lab, but instead to a small garden. Tears streaming down her face, Dr. Lila began to share her past with Dr. Bennett. She had a husband before the disaster and a charming six-year-old daughter. The disaster led to her daughter biting her father, and she lost her family. Since then, Dr. Lila had sworn to find a cure for the virus, to save as many families on the brink of destruction as possible. As she spoke, she began to cry in crocodile tears, moved by her own story. Dr. Bennett, feeling helpless, could only comfort her using his soft words and muscles. Little did they know that Felix, trapped in the lab, was freezing, his beard turning white. 
He was desperately trying to contact Huck through the intercom, but Huck never responded. Just as Felix was about to lose hope, the door suddenly opened with a bang. Thankfully, Huck had realized that the backup power system had activated early and hurried to reset the door control system. This delay nearly cost Felix his beardy life. Fortunately, Felix didn't fail the mission and obtained the green experimental reagent in the end. Now all Felix had to do was deliver it to Dr. Bennett. Meanwhile, Huck went to the command room, aiming to distract Lieutenant Anne, who was currently in charge of the experimental base while Kublek was away. Elsewhere in the small town, Asha took Elton to kill zombies and showed him a religious ceremony offering flowers to the sky, while Dev took Will to patrol the town's borders. Seeing no zombies around, Dev took out his handgun, about to show off his double-tap skill, when his head was suddenly blown off. Seeing Dev's bloodied face, Will quickly hit the deck like a scared chicken. Upon seeing the approaching soldiers from the Republic, he picked up Dev's gun and ran towards the small town in his wet pants. The scene then shifts to a muscular man who has become Dr. Lila's guinea pig. Although he knew he was doomed, he started to curse Dr. Lila, wishing her to meet Satan in hell. The doctor then took out a reagent and put it into the experimental device. The reagent was then vaporized and injected into the lab, causing the poor man to quickly show symptoms of lung spasms and start to cough nonstop. It didn't take long for him to stop making any sounds. During the process, Dr. Lila calmly recorded the experimental data. It seemed she had conducted such experiments many times before. To her surprise, the security walked in right after the experiment ended. They told her that a vial of the reagent had been stolen from the warehouse during the blackout the night before. Meanwhile, Dr. Bennett has obtained the green reagent that Felix had stolen. He started to analyze its composition and effects. After a simple test, he told his two daughters that the main ingredient was liquid chlorine, a deadly poison. Even a small inhalation could be lethal to humans. But the color of liquid chlorine is not green, which means that the group led by Kublek added other substances to it. Just as Dr. Bennett was preparing his lab equipment for more research, an enraged Dr. Lila stormed in. Right after entering, she confronted Dr. Bennett about stealing her experimental potion. What's more, the security were on their way, and if he handed over the potion now, she could help mediate, claiming that she had taken it for her own experiments. But Dr. Bennett no longer trusted her. He remained silent and opened the door when the security officers knocked. To his surprise, the security officers didn't listen to his explanation and immediately arrested him and escorted him out. Felix rushed forward to interfere but was also taken away by security. Before being taken away, Felix desperately signaled to Iris, hoping she would notify her sister Hope. Iris rushed home in a hurry but found Dr. Lila there. She was about to speak when she saw that Dr. Lila had already figured out that the reagent had been stolen by the two sisters. In order to retrieve the reagent, Dr. Lila took the two young girls into her top secret lab. She pointed to the corpse behind the glass cabinet, which was used as a specimen, and said that she had been researching resurrection over the years. Therefore, she needed to observe the state of humans at the brink of death. After her explanation, she opened a video of a zombie chasing a rat and explained that zombies do not follow the law of conservation of energy. As long as their heads aren't cut off, they will keep moving until they tire out the rat. Hence, as long as zombies exist, the world won't be safe. Now, Dr. Lila had developed a drug that can prevent humans from turning into zombies upon death. The previous operation by the Republic to exterminate Omaha was actually in order to facilitate Dr. Lila's live subject research. She believed that the sacrifice of Omaha was worth it. Only with these sacrifices could she develop a great drug to save humanity. Hope, perhaps persuaded, revealed the hiding place of the green reagent. Elsewhere, Anne arrived at the interrogation room, hoping to get some information out of Silas. However, Silas insisted that he was just lost. Anne didn't believe his smelly bullshit. Just at the crucial moment, the base leader, Dennis, came in and vouched for Silas. Anne agreed to release him. Back at the base, Dennis didn't blame Silas, but told him to go back to work. Dr. Bennett, on the other hand, was being interrogated by both Anne and Huck. Huck, fearing that Anne might extract some crucial information, kept diverting the topic to gossips about Dr. Bennett and his two daughters. At this moment, Dr. Lila walked in with the reagent. Seeing the lost reagent being found, Anne immediately ordered to stop all investigations. However, Dr. Lila didn't cover up for Dr. Bennett, but bluntly stated that the drugs were stolen by Dr. Bennett's daughters. She then told Anne about her significant breakthrough in her research, that the test subject hadn't revived after eight hours of death. She even claimed not to harm Dr. Bennett, whose existence was more important than any other scientist. 
After a brief consideration, Anne announced that Dr. Bennett and his family were innocent. As long as Dr. Bennett continued to assist in the research of the resurrection drug, they could provide a secure environment. After that, Anne left the interrogation room with Dr. Lila, eager to see the latest experimental results. However, upon entering the lab, they were met with a savage zombie test subject. Anne realized that Dr. Lila had lied about the breakthrough in the drug, so she ordered Huck to hold Dr. Lila at gunpoint, while she herself cut the rope binding the zombie. They then locked Dr. Lila in the narrow lab, watching as she was devoured by the zombie. Huck's obedience dispelled any doubts Anne might have had, revealing the whole truth to her. It turns out that the Republic had never considered the other two human habitats as allies, and hence had never leaked the location of their main city. The Republic even plans to launch a second military campaign in the near future to annihilate the other survival enclave in Portland. While waging external wars, their base human experiments mustn't cease. Thus, Huck was appointed to replace Dr. Lila to control Dr. Bennett. Despite her fatigue, Huck promptly agreed. Upon returning home and switching on the light, Huck found her nemesis, Percy, sitting on her sofa, pointing a gun at her. Knowing she was helpless, Huck sat opposite Percy, admitting that she had killed his uncle due to circumstances beyond her control. She even suggested that if he wanted revenge, he could go ahead, but Percy hesitated. If he killed Huck, his love affair with Iris would be over. So he decided to let his uncle's memory be the sacrifice. Huck revealed the secret of the Republic. Hearing this, Percy abandoned his murderous intentions and ran to consult Dr. Bennett, while Huck found Dennis to discuss how to thwart the Republic's evil plans. After some discussion, Huck and Dennis decided to ally with Dr. Bennett and mobilize all possible resources to resist the Republic. The first step was for Dr. Bennett to lead the scientist team out of the city's control. Unfortunately, their every move was being monitored, and as soon as they started to connect with each other, an arrest plan was initiated. However, since Huck's true identity was not yet exposed, she was able to warn everyone in advance, enabling them to escape to the lab. Dr. Bennett had prepared a secret tunnel. With a few hammer strikes, they could escape through the underground passage. But Anne ordered all doors in the base to be closed, trapping Dr. Bennett and the others in the lab. Meanwhile, Will returned to the small town and reported that Dev had been killed by the Republic's army. The mayor immediately realized that the Republic was turning against them and announced a full retreat. She would resign from her position once everyone was safe. Having just lost her son Dev, she was obviously despondent. Unfortunately, the old man in the town was a spy for the Republic, and as soon as the mayor announced the retreat, he reported it. Soon after, soldiers drove armored vehicles into the town, capturing everyone. The old man found Huck and threatened her with her double agent status, demanding a formal identity from the Republic. However, Huck took the chance to shoot him, because only the dead can keep secrets. On hearing the gunshot, Anne rushed over and found Huck had killed the old man. She picked up a walkie-talkie and ordered everyone to open fire. At the crucial moment, the hiding Will fired a shot. Silas and Dennis also drew their guns to help. The unprepared soldiers from the Republic fell instantly while the others sought shelter. Under the chaos, the townsfolk tried to hide from the bullets, and the braver ones started looking for weapons. As the gunfight ensued, a wounded squad leader struggled to his feet and made a shot. He then aimed his gun at Elton, but before he could fire, a gunshot was heard from behind. It was the mayor who shot him instead. The gunfight then continued, with bullets flying back and forth like rain. Unfortunately, the unlucky town members kept getting shot, while the foolish soldiers grouped together and were blown away by a grenade thrown by Dennis. Seeing that, the survivors looked at Dennis with respect and hoped he would become their new leader and lead them out of the siege. However, Dennis lifted his shirt to reveal a gunshot wound on his stomach, indicating that he was going to meet Jesus in this episode. On the other side, the soldiers had managed to open the doors of the lab. Little did they know, Dr. Bennett had prepared a welcome gift for them. A sudden explosion took the lives of several soldiers. By the time the others deemed it safe to enter, they discovered that Dr. Bennett had tunneled his way out. The explosion had collapsed the tunnel, preventing immediate pursuit by the soldiers. Upon hearing this report, Anne was furious. She immediately changed her previous order, instructing the soldiers to kill Dr. Bennett and his family instead. Inside the underground passage, a group of Republic soldiers were searching for Dr. Bennett and his associates with their rifles. 
Suddenly, they were confronted by a large group of white-coated figures. The soldiers pulled the trigger, and after a chorus of gunfire, the figures were annihilated. It was then that the soldiers realized that their targets were not Dr. Bennett and his associates, but a horde of zombies. On the back of a zombie was a remote-controlled bomb modified from a signal generator. From a distance, Dr. Bennett watched the green dot on his device. As soon as he saw the zombie stop moving, he pressed the detonation button, instantly wiping out the pursuing soldiers. After intimidating several teams of soldiers with his explosions, he made contact with Anne via a walkie-talkie to initiate the next negotiation. His bargaining chip was the son of the Republic's general since they had captured him. Anne had to compromise as soon as she heard the hostage's voice. Then, Dr. Bennett demanded a fuel-filled transport vehicle which Anne agreed to provide. Meanwhile, the group had relocated to a desolate warehouse. Dennis, who was severely wounded, could only lay on a couch while Elton tried to extract the bullet from his wound. He was nervous about performing this operation for the first time and took a big swig of liquor before the surgery. Surprisingly, he managed to pull out the bullet. However, Dennis could no longer participate in the following actions. So Elton and Silas took over Dennis's role, driving a jeep towards the base, firing firecrackers along the way to attract zombies. After reaching the research base, they didn't hurry back but instead infiltrated the base's hospital, intending to get some antibiotics for Dennis. Since the base was short-staffed, all soldiers were on the front line, and the trainees under Dennis's command were conscripted to patrol the base. When one of them saw Silas sneaking around the hospital, he pointed his gun at him. Fortunately, Elton appeared behind him and knocked him out. Zombies had already surrounded the hospital. To escape safely, the two brothers used the metal globe artwork as a shield. They rolled it out of the base, crushing any zombies in their path. Meanwhile, the car promised by Anne also arrived at the scene. The people in the lab began to pack their belongings, preparing to leave. Before they left, Felix brought Hope to the warehouse of the lab, intending to plant a bomb to destroy all the developed toxic agents. Unfortunately, his plan was thwarted as the warehouse had been emptied by Anne's men before they arrived. With no other choice, Felix had to change the plan, leading everyone to start escaping. But instead of getting into the car prepared by Anne, they used the tunnel to arrive at the main gate. They planned to use Percy's theft skills to hijack a random car and break through the gate. Little did they know Anne had seen through their plan. She had prepared an ambush at the gate while pretending to have a getaway car ready. Unable to convey the situation outside, Huck could only watch as Felix and the others fell into the trap. Anne started to taunt them, trying to convince them to surrender. Meanwhile, the soldiers began to quietly flank them. While Felix and the others were distracted by Anne, several zombies joined the fray. Felix immediately shot them down. Seeing an opportunity, the hostage broke free from Percy's grip and ran towards Anne. Without thinking, Percy chased after him, but the soldiers then opened fire. After several gunshots, poor Percy lay in a pool of blood. Seeing the situation getting out of hand, Huck could no longer stand by. She swiftly drew her pistol, shooting down Anne's guards and taking Anne hostage. With their leader under control, the soldiers slowed down their attack. Felix quickly killed them off. Iris rushed to Percy's side, holding his body and crying. Hope, filled with anger, aimed her gun at the hostage. However, Iris stopped her, fearing that killing the hostage would worsen her mental issues. By this time, Felix had hijacked a car, picked up the sisters, and drove off. Seeing everyone had escaped, Huck also stole a car and left. As soon as Anne regained her freedom, she rushed to save the hostage because he was the son of the general, and only if he was safe could Anne keep her own position. Due to the fight at the gate, the attention of the main force was drawn, and Dr. Bennett easily hijacked a troop transport vehicle and escaped with the others. Unfortunately, Anne had prepared for this and had planted numerous spikes on the escape route. The vehicle tires burst, and they had to temporarily stop to repair the vehicle. At the same time, Dr. Bennett called Felix for help via radio. Felix instructed the sisters to go ahead while he turned back. Unexpectedly, the sisters ran into Elton and Silas on their way. The recent events had taken a toll on everyone, and they could not control their emotions. They hugged each other but without a kiss. On the other side, Huck was driving to the warehouse. Looking at Dennis, who was barely breathing on the couch, Huck couldn't hold back any longer. She ran outside alone, shedding tears in secret. As she cried, she suddenly noticed that the surrounding shipping containers looked unfamiliar. It turns out that these containers stored toxic substances that Anne had moved out. Huck urgently contacted the sisters through the radio, asking them to bring some explosives. Soon, four young people started their action, swiftly clearing away the annoying zombies and heading towards the warehouse. 
Upon seeing Dennis and Huck, they took out medicine to treat Dennis. Afterwards, Huck let the young people retreat first, and she would destroy these containers. As everyone planned to leave, Silas stepped forward, expressing his intention to stay and fight with Dennis and Huck. Unfortunately, signal jammers had been released from the Republic, which destroyed the remote control system for the explosives. If they wanted to detonate these bombs remotely, they would have to fetch the timed detonator from a warehouse miles away. Seeing that Dennis was injured and could hardly move, Silas took on the task, driving away from the warehouse with Dennis, while Huck stayed behind to guard these containers. On the other side, Felix had also found Dr. Bennett and others. But before they could fix the car, a squad of soldiers started to chase them. A battle quickly broke out. Knowing that they were outnumbered, Felix rushed out alone to draw the enemy's fire. The squad leader took the bait and pursued him. They ran for several miles until the road ahead was blocked by a large iron gate. Felix stopped running and the squad leader, seeing that Felix was no longer running, revealed a hunter's mercy. He used his last few bullets to take down the approaching zombies, then pulled out his baton, ready to have a go at Felix. But Felix cleverly cut the rope of the iron gate, then retreated behind it, releasing a horde of zombies. The zombies couldn't reach Felix, so they all pounced on the squad leader. Out of options, the squad leader had to pull out a dagger and started slashing at the zombies with all his might. After he had killed many zombies, Felix finally emerged from behind the gate. Seeing that the squad leader's strength was nearly exhausted, Felix prepared to deliver the final blow. He joined two bayonets together and attacked the squad leader. A few zombies tried to join in the chaos, but they were also easily taken down by Felix. The squad leader, half of his strength spent, was trying to dodge the attack. Felix, on the other hand, killed the zombies while constantly pressing forward. Finally, he stabbed the squad leader in the stomach. Felix then stepped on the bayonet, and the squad leader was disemboweled, his innards spilling all over the ground. The diabetic smell quickly attracted the surrounding zombies, who soon devoured the squad leader. Meanwhile, Dr. Bennett and Will were having a tough fight. Fortunately, these soldiers were not familiar with field battles. Dr. Bennett only attacked when the enemy was tired and retreated when the enemy advanced. In the end, he eliminated the enemy's main forces. At this time, Anne also remembered the drugs she had left in the warehouse and hurriedly flew there in a helicopter. Unexpectedly, as soon as she entered the warehouse, she was ambushed by Huck, causing her pistol to be knocked to the ground, and the two started their ultimate battle in the warehouse. Huck, worried about Anne's inadequate combat power, even threw her a spear. The two then wrestled their skinny muscles while talking bullshit, and it was hard to tell who was winning. The verbal jabs were also evenly matched. Anne was so eager to win that blood even started flowing from her running nose. She secretly pulled out a dagger and stabbed Huck during their struggle. Huck instantly lost her strength and fell to the ground, but she was still talking bullshit to Anne. At this point, Anne realized that Huck was just stalling for time. Huck then smiled and told her that she had already installed a timed bomb in the containers and that it should be about to explode. Anne quickly ordered her men to board the helicopter. Just as the helicopter took off, a mushroom cloud rose into the sky. Dennis and Silas, who were looking for the timed detonator, then realized that Huck just wanted to distract them. Dennis's wound burst open again in his emotional turmoil. At this time, the sound of a helicopter from the Republic could be heard from outside the house. In order to ensure Silas's survival, Dennis immediately ordered him to shoot. Only by killing himself, the traitor could he save Silas. Thus, Dennis sacrificed his own life to ensure Silas's safety. However, Silas was captured by the invading soldiers. Meanwhile, Hope and the others were rushing back, encountering a large wave of zombies. Just as they were about to be surrounded, a burst of gunfire echoed from ahead. At that moment, the mayor, driving a jeep and manning a machine gun, came to their rescue. The reinforcements filled the group with relief, and for a moment, they let their guard down. Suddenly, a zombie lunged at Hope's sexy body, who was lagging behind. Without a second thought, Elton threw his ugly body in front of Hope, his arm taking the brunt of the attack. The zombie severely bit his forearm rather than his smelly part. The group quickly performed surgery on him, amputating his hormone-let-go arm to prevent him from turning into a zombie. Silas, on the other hand, had gained Anne's trust because he had killed the traitor. Upon his return to the Republic, Anne shifted her attention to Colonel Kublek. Kublek's daughter, Huck, had become a traitor and seized the opportunity to frame her mother. She successfully had Kublek imprisoned. As for the main group, they distanced themselves from the city's power struggles and returned to a peaceful life in the countryside. Lovers such as Felix and Will were finally able to be together, living a happy life. 
The scientists also re-established their lab, beginning to explore new ways to save humanity. As for the ambitious people within the Republic, it's not certain whether they will continue to destroy other human habitats or whether they will continue its terrifying biochemical research. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.